All right, guys, we are going to continue uh, through our progression of the book. Chapter 7 is how to work in more detail with views. And uh, I can't help but think of Razor Views. I can't help but think of that uh, Marvel movie. Wasn't there like a Razor face? Wasn't there a character? Thank you. It's like, it's like when he really had a message, just tell them it came from Ray's or Ray's and everyone laughed. <laughs> That's what it is. <laughs> all right, all right. <laughs> hey, Sam. 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 Hey, the recording doesn't think I'm crazy. This is on the Marvel movie Shang Chi or Shang Chi, and the character was I, I suppose this is his nickname. I don't know. I think is Razor Fist, and he had a car that said Razor on the side of it. Point is, that's what I think of every time when I see Razor views. I can't help but think of that car. Moving on. Um, razor syntax is this idea, as you guys know, of mixing your C sharp with your HTML. And um, we're just going to be diving a little bit deeper into this. And so right off of the bat, there, um, there's a code block, which is anytime you see a block of code as identified with the curly braces. Um, you know, that's a, a syntax for a razor code block versus a single line or what you might consider an inline expression. Um, what it boils down to is if you've got like a little bit of math in here and you want this math to be processed by the server, um, then these parentheses are mandatory, right? So when you have an inline expression, uh, if, if you need processing to happen, you need the parentheses. However, oftentimes when you have an inline expression, you'll just have something like at model dot name and those parentheses are not needed. Okay, so um, again, you've seen both of these things before. Just a little, that's just basically how this chapter goes. It's going to be a lot of, you've seen this before, but just a little bit more explanation kind of behind the scenes. Um, and so if we're looking at a view, um, this is a view that uses both a block of code uh, as well as some of these inline statements, right? And so if we kind of take a look at what's happening, we're more or less setting the value or initializing this variable inside of the block to either welcome or welcome back. Um, based on the view bag customer name, which comes from the controller. The controller was in the previous slide. I kind of skipped over it, but basically if there is a customer name, then you're going to welcome back the customer. Otherwise you don't, uh, and you populate that with an inline statement. This is our variable, the message variable. Um, and again, the parentheses dictate that you would be doing a little bit of math. Now, it is also noted that your logic really shouldn't be executed in the views like this. Best practice is to keep your business logic in either the models, best practice, right? Your business logic belongs in the models. Um, or the or alternatively the controller but this is just a demonstration how you could put some logic in uh, in a view um, then then ultimately if you're keeping your logic in the controllers or in the models then all you're really using is this razor block of code or this razor inline statement to just display your data Um, and so 
that's kind of the output there as you might expect. Uh, just another example of using a for loop. So basically, you know, we kind of start by saying, hey, we can have blocks of codes, we can have inline statements with these razor uh, syntax. If I didn't say it already, I think it's obvious. It always starts with the at symbol. Pretty obvious. Um, you can have for loops and you can have if statements. Um, and so here's a for loop. I think actually up above there's an if statement inside of the block. So your traditional coding structures, loops, if statements. Again, it's merging the C sharp and the HTML. Um, you know, so just glancing at this, we're looping through. The text that the user sees is right here in between the opening option tag and the closing option tag. So this will say option 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12. And the value um, that's often used by the server side code is uh, in, the, in the inner attribute of the value attribute. Okay, so um, the demonstration that we have here um, is loading up a view bag object called categories with a list. This is just a list of strings uh, and then you know, basically from the controller, uh, sending it back to the assumedly home controller. Uh, so the the index view of the home con uh, of the home page. Uh, and then how you could take a view that receives that, those categories loop over them in one category at a time so we have a for each loop one category at a time you know populate some some links um not a ton of new code here we've kind of already done that i know yeah a lot of this is absolutely review um it is somewhere in the middle towards the end that there's some new stuff okay. um but if nothing else, it's just a little bit more of an explanation, whereas before it was assumed that you could just figure it out. But now this, this just dives into the full explanation. Um, and here's that if else, if else block of code using razor syntax. <coughs> Excuse me. Along with a switch. Uh, this chunk of code, and I don't know, I explain it as if you guys don't know what it's doing, but I, I'm, I'm betting most of you could probably take a look at that and say, okay, we've got an anchor tag, so we've got a link. We've got some tag helpers. We're actually going to dive a little bit deeper into those tag helpers, specifically this one. Um... Now we've got some classes, right? This is the first class is list group item. So that's going to be a bootstrap class. And then we have a little if block that says, hey, if there's a category name of all, then you add the active text to the class. Um, this is OK, but very quickly they show you another syntax for doing the same thing. Um, which is this ternary, which is, again, we, we did this in JavaScript, right? We used a lot of these ternaries. Um, same logic, though. It's an if-else. Same anchor tag. And if the category name property is all, then we apply active. Otherwise, we don't. The, the one thing that's a little bit different here is this text HTML tag. Um, you know, as long as I've been writing HTML, 
I don't know how many times I've used a text tag, not too often, but basically that gets this class rendered, you know, um, as a piece of text, right? So it would be class of list group item space active. And if you use, the, use this if syntax, um, that's, that's the hack, if you will. If you use a ternary, notice that's not there. So the ternary is just better all around. It's more condensed, and you don't have to add that text tag um, for this code chunk. Um, the other thing that I noticed is like this opening quote for the classes basically isn't closed to the right before the angle bracket here. Right, so all of this if statement basically it puts a piece of text in there or it doesn't. Same thing here. So this is the closing quote for associated with this opening quote. Right, so just getting all the quotes to line up sometimes is uh, a challenge. Questions, comments so far? Doing good? Nothing to belabor. Um, they do work a lot with this Guitar Shop app in this chapter um, so I went ahead and this is in your student files if you wanted to go to your student files let me see if I can find it student download and then there's book apps so if you kind of wanted to follow along locally I've got 7a guitar shop B and C I just opened up C assumingly that's the finished one um, you can follow along or just watch my screen I'll I don't know how much coding along I'll be doing this particular lecture um, but I went ahead and booted that up and so I've got my 7c guitar shop I have a question. yeah uh, you said that was in book apps or apps? that was in book apps yes sir okay. and then once you get this you got to go to your package manager console and you got to run one command which is update database if you run the update database inside of your package manager console, you'll be gifted with this guitar shop database. It has a products table and a categories table. As you might guess, if you're looking at the models, we've got category and we've got product. And we've got a context with a couple of tables in it, some dummy data, and a bunch of products. So if I just view the products, view data, there's our data. And if I boot it up, let's just kind of glance at it. View our products. So slash products is essentially our list page. So this is listing all of our products. And if I go to view details, now uh, it's under, instead of the slash product slash list, we're now slash product slash details with uh, an ID that's sent over and a slug, right? Um, this is pretty cool because I know someone said, hey, I want to work with images. And so this, this is a good demonstration of doing that. So we'll get into, we'll dig into those details because that is new. We haven't worked with images net yet. And um, we haven't really done um, permissions yet, right? So there is a link for admin that takes, takes us to slash admin, but we have to learn, you know, login systems. So just notice admin just takes you to this route, but there's really, um, there's no login yet. Uh, however, there is an area for admin. If we kind of dig back into areas, admin kind of introduced this concept of areas before where we have their own particular set of what admins can do where they can list, they can add and update. Whereas a standard user, if I go to product, product, all they can do is get the details and list. 
right? So you're kind of taking your CRUD functionality and you're just, now you're just kind of separating it. You're saying, hey, your standard users can do these things and your admins can do some different things. And although we don't have a login system yet, they're in different portions of the application. So I thought that was kind of cool. Um, so definitely some new things that we'll explore as we go through this. Again, now that we're in admin, we got categories and we can um, click back. Let's go, we're in admin, manage products, add new product and it's broken. But the point is, you know, the, the features are there if you put in the data correctly and get the validation in there correctly. Uh, so anyways. This is, um, this is a finished guitar shop app that does have the admin area configured just glancing at this particular slide looking at uh, looking at this this does not have the admins and you'll notice it says the starting folders right so if I go back to student downloads ex starts the guitar shop kind of at a starting point would be in a different place right so the example starts this is actually what we're going to do together at the end of this just like last time we did a little walk through in the back of the chapter, we'll do that here. And we'll use this particular view. Um, what do we have? We still have a default route configured. Of course, that's in the program CS. Um, and I think you guys realize this if I kind of go into a controller there's really a couple of ways um, if I just go to home controller right so bless you you know we we've already done this where we just basically say you know return to the view basically it, it goes to the to the view at that point without sending any other data over maybe you got some view bag data but you're not sending any model data over, right? So this view on this PowerPoint, really there's, this is an overloaded method, right? So this, this view can return empty or it can return some model data. And so there's really a couple of ways to work with the view. Um, kind of look at it there's more overloads than just two um, and we did use this one for example we returned to a particular view so if you look at this particular overload it says hey you know don't return to my default view name because by default it goes there's a convention there it goes to a particular view if you don't want to do that you can send a string over Right, and that string says no. Don't go to my, don't go to the default view. Instead, go to a different view, and then send the the model object over. Right, so we've done that. We've done that as well. Um, it. One thing that I've struggled with, you know, since since doing this, every time uh, you return a view, like all of these, return view, return view, return view, return view says it creates a view result object. That's weird to me. Many times, right, when you return an object, it would just say creates a view object. Nope, this doesn't say creates a view object. This is a view result. And my reason for kind of coming here So this is just a method, but uh, if you click on view result object, 
there's a view results class. So normally a view result class has a constructor called view result, right? So it's, it's just, I would expect it essentially to say return view result. It doesn't, it says return view. There's something weird going on there. That's not intuitive to me. I would expect it to return a view result. Not that my confusion needs to be any part of your confusion, but that's not intuitive to me. Moving on. Um, again, they just show you the convention that this home controller has an index method and Therefore, the view that it's going to is the index view inside of the home folder, inside of the views folder. Yesterday, Vinny said, man, I feel like this video is telling me the same thing like 10 times. You're getting a little bit of that here too, right? Like you're, you're used to some of this by now. It's just a little bit of review. Product controller index method is going to go to views product list. Why does it go to list? Because we're using this overloaded method and we're not following the convention. We can return to a different view by overloading, by calling this overloaded version of this method. Otherwise, it just follows the convention. This calls list um, and this calls details. because it's not using that overloaded version with the string in it. We are also going to dive a little bit deeper, not much deeper, just like one layer deeper into these um, layouts um, kind of towards the end. These layouts are where all of you uh, kind of wired up your dependencies like Bootstrap, um, any custom CSS that you want to write. You wire them up here inside of a layout CSHTML file. And then inside of a view start file, you kind of set your layout for your entire site here. That way you don't have to go into each individual view and set the layout on the view, right? Of course, that can be overridden. If, if in the view start you set the entire layout for the site and you want one view to use a different layout, you could use one of these code blocks and override that. That's not a problem. That works just fine. And you've used tag helpers now for several chapters, right? So there's a view, there's a layout file, there's a view start file, and a view imports file, and they're scattered in different places, right? You just got to know where those places are kind of here, view imports. It's also a good using statement to add, to add the namespace of guitar shop models. That way on your views, if I go to like my product view, this product exists inside of the models namespace. Right? So the guitar shop models. This is where I define my product. And so by adding this using statement, I can directly access my model. Otherwise, if I go back to my view here, you have to give it the fully qualified path. Right? So if you if you don't have that using statement, you could do uh guitar shop dot models dot product right so adding that using statement prevents me from having to give it the full path which is nice all right and I literally think chapter four, we did exactly this. We deleted everything on a template and we added one thing at a time. Okay. Um, when it comes to our links, literally this is a lab that all of you just did where you used 
ASP controller, ASP action, and ASP route. This last piece right here is a piece that I got hung up on. Uh, Ryan was exactly right when he said that this ASP route had to match an identifier of one of your route parameters. Um, and so, in the default route, in the default route in program.cs, we have one parameter uh, here I guess there is also a slug parameter here but because this variable is named ID that allows this anchor tag to have a route ASP hyphen route hyphen ID and so Ryan correctly pointed out that basically those two things by convention have to match otherwise what happened and so this would create a link like what this it actually this link and this link create the same URL right so if, if you're looking at this slash product slash list slash guitars because we come from HTML like I think this is just a little bit more natural than using these helper tags, right? But if you are wondering, like I was, well, this is easy. This seems less intuitive because we've been doing it like this for a long time. Why then, what's the benefit? What's the benefit of using these helper tags? Well, the benefit of using the helper tags is that it's a little bit more dynamic in that you can refactor your code uh, and maybe change uh, uh, what does the book say? The book says you can change either the, the product to products or list to lists and this tag helper doesn't also have to be refactored. Um, so the book makes the point that this is a little bit more I guess you would say dynamic in nature and is as you're refactoring your code if you're updating things you wouldn't also have to update your your link uh, because this would be more dynamic okay I get it and I know my explanation didn't do that justice um, so when I fall short easier to like also dynamically create links like in a for loop or something too yeah we we use them a lot in a for loop to generate based on like information in a view back right that is correct um okay so i i don't read from the book super often but when my explanations fall short, at least in my own head, I will. I'm on page 246. Page 246, first paragraph, second sentence. However, in general, it is considered best practice to use tag helpers to generate the URL for a link. And it explains that. I remember reading it, I just gotta remember where. Okay, yeah, here it is. Between these approaches, so using the top approach and the, and the second approach, the first approach is short and easy to read, but the second approach is recommended because it's more flexible. Being flexible is a good thing. For example, if you change the routing for the app, so the list action method of the product controller maps to slash products instead of slash product slash list. The second approach adjusts automatically. So in, in the example they give in the book, they change 
routing in in this particular app and then when you change the routing you don't also have to adjust the link Um, and as Josh pointed out, these are a little bit more dynamic because what we did in, in even in our lab, we were, we did something like, um, we put like IDs in here. We would do something like at model dot, mm -hmm. um, product ID. Right, so we were able to use those inside of a for loop. Um, I'm assuming you could do that on the top. That's kind of yeah. You're you're probably right. Yep, you you could definitely do that on the top one as well. I think that uh, on that same page you're on, the last uh, paragraph kind of is an interesting one too. Like it says the query strings in the URL makes the URL difficult to read. So the best practice is to uh, do with the uh, with the with the tag helpers mm -hmm. so that avoids that. Mm -hmm. Regardless of like the dimensions, I, are they saying if you can both be achieved from the same domain? Yes. Okay. Yeah, they're saying basically this link and these link, you know, they're going to give you this. They're going to take you to the same spot. Yeah. But the the second one, even though it's a newer syntax for us, is slightly recommended over the top. Of course, that's why they made these tag helpers in the first place. Yeah. Is because they think they can make better links. That's what the first method, like if you have a large code base, well, you're going to change it now. You got to change every instance of that. Yeah, if you got if you got this link, all yeah, in many places, you got to chase every instance of that. That's exactly right. Mm -hmm. Um. We did this a little bit. Like notice here, you're you're specifying what controller and the action and a parameter essentially is what you're doing here. Um, if you leave the controller off, it assumes the controller that you're basically already in. So if in this case you're in the index dot CSHTML inside of the home folder, inside of the views folder, then of course it's just going to assume the controller is home. Because that's where this view is located. Um, but if you need to code it to a different controller, then of course you specify the controller. If you're in the home controller and say, hey, take me to the product list. There you have it. You have any? No, it, 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 that would work. Um, good question. It would make sense to code the controller first. Right, because like it's in the order right. of that. Right, right. No. So the way this works, and it's, it's a good question. It's something that's actually coming up a little bit. This is not the HTML that's sent down to the browser. This helper is actually processed on the server, and then the server sends standard HTML down. So all of these helper tags, you're, you'll never see those if you right click on the page in, in view source, right? These helper tags are processed on the server and it sends standard HTML back. Um, and so you talk about a lot of times in this is like what processing happens on the server and what processing happens on the client. You know, these helper tags are a little bit of work on the server. And so they're going to basically render the HTML. They're smart enough to know the server, you know, whoever made this stuff is smart enough to say, okay, if they code this attribute first, this helper attribute first, you know, let's send it down to the client in the proper way. Um, okay, so because this ID is a parameter that exists in one of our routes, then it generates a URL where the guitars is, is uh, one of these segments, you would say, right? 
Whereas if you take a look at this one, here's ASP route, just like this is ASP route ID, this is ASP route hyphen page one. Well, there is no, in, in this particular case, there is no route that has a page uh, a parameter. And because of that, it defaults to this query string. When you see this question mark in the URL, you know that's a query string. Query string is data that's stored in the URL, okay? And the syntax for a query string, you can kind of see it here. It starts with a question mark, then a piece of data, then the value of that data to the right equals, and then the value. The next piece of data has an ampersand, right? So the next piece of data is sort underscore by. Well, that's this route. Sort underscore by is price, and so price is the value. And so what Josh pointed out earlier is kind of like, hey, if you're choosing, like literally, if you get to choose between this cleaner syntax and this less clean syntax, what could you do to clean this up? Well, you would have to make a route that accepts two parameters, the first one being a page parameter, the next one being a sort by parameter. And then that would help to clean up your URL to be something like, like above. Okay, so that's, and, and again, they, they recommend using that. However, you know, query strings are on most websites, right? So they say it's not best practice, but they're everywhere. Okay. So just examining a little bit more code, and that's that's a lot of what this is today, just examining the code. So seen some of it before. We're getting into some, some different stuff a little bit. Um, standard link, anchor tag, product controller, list action. That's, that's easy enough. Product controller, list action, with an ID of guitars. So the way that these products work is that they have a category right this ID is a category ID and so you can filter by guitars and so that's what this link does it pass, passes this third attribute the controller would use that as the ID to filter by the category of guitars and so if I go back into my data you can kind of assume Here's my categories. Guitars is category ID of one. So if I go into my products and see which ones have a category ID of one, one, two, three, four, five, six guitars. Therefore, in Firefox, if I go to my site and I go to my products, and I filter by guitars slash products slash guitars so this is products controller there's no it's not showing the list because we, we actually learned last week how to take that word out right so it's it's the it is the list but then the filter is guitars you have any That is correct. Okay. Uh, so let's let's look at this. Let's, let's look at that, right? So so Vinny was right. So we're going to go to the product list uh, inside of the controller. Uh, product controller. So here's our list. And you can see to get to this list, we can just go to the product slash and, and it's no longer list we just uh, have a static s right so that's going to take product which is because this is the product controller singular right you with me with the s on that okay so this is products and we're sending in the id of guitar 
So this list is, okay, well, if you don't pass me an ID, I'm just going to assume all, and I'm going to select star from my products. So if the ID is all, here's my select star, select all my products. Otherwise, filter where the category name is guitars, right? So that was your question one, is that URL is coming from right there, mm -hmm. which is correct. What's question two? Oh, excuse me. I was just curious oh. how, I still can't wrap around my head around the, how they're taking the word guitar and relating it to the ID behind the guitar, but you answered it with that where, um, how it's filtering. Yeah, so this where clause right here, where the product category name is guitar. Can I say something about that? Yeah, too? yeah. So, or maybe it was more of a question, but sure. Um, the product has a category, but the category isn't like explicitly, um, like in the product it, table. It actually, your your, it is. Well, it, it is, but it's it not is. stored, right? Like it it is. Here's the full category. Right, but if you go, okay. So can you go to the database for like products? I just it's see. not in the database. Yeah. You're right. Yeah, it's the pro it's the category ID there. It is. So that's why it's a little confusing. That's why it's confusing. Mm -hmm. But but it's because of this um, navigation property, I believe this is called a navigation property is what they call that yeah. versus the uh, category ID um Category ID is your foreign key property, yeah. right? So you store both. Um, but it's because of this fellow right here that allows us to, on the controller, oh, man, there's just too many files. You guys know what I'm talking about? <laughs> there's just too many files. I do, too. You, I am just like, now, some people I know, they thrive, open a 1,000 tabs. That's never been me. I gotta have like two or three tabs open, and it's like it's like that with my cell phone too, right? You gotta either clear the notifications or you got ten thousand emails. It's one or the other. <laughs> Can't do it. Yeah. Computers go. Can't do it. Can't do it. But okay, so. But when you see like p.category.name, like there's a second, um, you know, property on it. Like yes. Category.name. Like if it's just p.productID or c.categoryID, then you know that's directly stored in the database under products or under categories. But when it comes out of the database, though. Yeah, I know what you're saying. Yeah. I know what you're saying. That's my only discrepancy with this, and I think that's what makes it a little confusing. Yeah. Um, because somehow it's doing its magic where you don't have to relate to the other table. It's just kind of already getting it based on the foreign key. It, it does get it based on that. I think because of that ID and that category together. Yeah. Right? I think it's because of those two things together, it's able to say, okay, well, it's coming out as a one. It's coming out of a one of the table. And so you got to connect that back to the... So what's really behind the scenes here is ultimately is a is a join, right? There's going to be a join that is generated to to be able to pull that out. So what's behind the scenes here is a SQL query that's that's hitting a join that's ultimately yeah, it's joining based on those IDs. Mm -hmm. But we're not seeing that join and we've done joins and so we understand that we have to join on ID, but we're just not doing that here. The SQL statements that run. Yeah, I bet you if we were to look closer, we would see that. Um, there's our joints. Yeah. Beautiful. Beautiful. Yes. So it's doing a join behind the scenes. Yeah, I think so. Like he said, how many files there are really confusing it. And it's so hard to track. You're not wrong. 
You're not wrong. I think once I actually like, do a code example, it might put kind of what happens. Yeah, of course. Right? So this is the same route filtering by a different <laughs> category, same route filtering by a different category. Um, okay. You guys typically grab, um, well, let's see. Is there anything else here? So that's our list. That's our list by guitars uh, versus a details. So let's let's click on a details. So let's go all, view details. So this is our, what, this is our first guitar, and this is the slug for what it is. Um, slash product, so product controller, details action, one is our ID, takes us here, of course, then the view, the view for that is product details, where we bring in a product And here we use the, the model price, the model discount percent, the discount amount. Here's our image tag. Now what's really interesting is that this is a, it's a tag helper, right? So we haven't done images. Uh, images says go to the root. So in the WW root, so go to the root slash images, and there's where we're going to store. Again, static files tend to go in WW root. You know, thinking back to uh, React, and you guys, even in your first semester, you guys did some React projects, and I know you got images. We were doing like CRUD on cars and that kind of stuff in video games, and you guys got images basically saved in the same place, right? You guys had like a WW root folder, uh, or I think it was called public. I think it was called public over there. But it was the same kind of concept. Anyways, back to the image tag. Uh, we have in the view bag an image file name, right? So coming from our controller, our controller is going to have to set that image file name. Let's look at that. Product controller inside of our details. So this, uh, I just saw it. Image file name right here is our product code plus an underscore m dot png. So the m's um, are the size, right? L, M, and S large, medium, small. And so this is just to say, hey, grab the products code medium PNG. Which is, so ultimately we're storing the product code. That's your file name. You're saving that in the database. So you're reading the file name essentially out of the database and appending the file type, loading that up in view bag and then looking at that in the controller, right? So it's really up to them and the whole like images thing. Like how are, how are we gonna add images? Like where are we gonna add a product? How are you gonna add an image of the guitar? Yeah, so you have to be able to, at that point, do something that we haven't done, which is essentially a file upload to the server. Um, so you think about what you're talking about is like, hey, an upload to Instagram and an upload, but um, right now our server is, is local. So what we would have to do, and I don't know that this book covers it, but that's what you have to do. You have to be able to basically provide a file upload control. That's easy. Getting it to save that in this. And also notice there's a convention here. Notice the, the, the name convention. You think end users are going to follow any sort of convention that you set? Probably not. So you got to take their file name and rename it under some sort of convention. But that's that's what you're talking about. You're, you're going to have to allow an end user to upload a, f uh, a picture. 
save it to a particular place on your machine, probably follow some sort of naming convention so that you can do something like this. Um, it's not the most complicated thing in the world. Obviously, a lot of websites do that. But allowing user to upload anything is always a challenge. It is always a challenge. Yeah, yeah. Let's let's look at it. Uh, admin, manage products, add new product. Yeah, there's, not even there's not even the option. things like media repositories I'm pretty sure they're called and that's like another way you can store photos and videos and files and stuff like that um, yeah so ultimately you're right this is not it's not technically saved in a database right our images are just saved on a computer somewhere but it's not in a database and so there are some repositories databases whatever that, that do save the images themselves keep in mind images can be huge right so and is a database we covered it a little bit last semester is like a lot of times images and videos are just saved on the file system not in the database uh, for various reasons and whether that's efficiency or what have you um, all right so a lot of review right a little bit of new stuff kind of sprinkled in all four of these tag helpers are for anchor tags, right? So these are specifically for anchor tags. Thus, you know, we're, we're generating URLs, right? So the three that we've already discussed are these right here. ASP action helper um, attribute route ID and controller. So those are the three that we've used and those are the three that we're familiar with. This one being the newest, uh, but then there's more, right? So here's four new ones um, that are actually pretty pretty simple. Um, area, you know, we we are going to have a slash areas directory. So ASP area will let you specify the name of your area, uh, like admin kind of thing. And so you specify the admin directory of an area. And then these three, uh, so far, all of our links have been relative links. Remember, those are links internal uh, to our site. Internal, <coughs> I-N-T-E-R-N-A-L. Uh, but then if you remember going back to our HTML days, right, there's also absolute links, right, which are links external to our site uh, that are coded with HTTPS colon slash slash www, right? They kind of have this in front of it, followed by the uh, domain name dot TLD, right? Top level domain, right? Dot com, dot net, dot org, et cetera. Um, these three pieces together help you configure absolute links. Right, so the protocol is the HTTP. The host is this piece right here. Um, and you can kind of see how that ties in together. Um, here's, your, here's your ASP area. Again, this is a relative link um, that takes you to the admin portion of your uh, directory structure. The one right here, I'm going to kind of back this up. These absolute links are these two right here. And then a fragment, if you've ever used Wikipedia, you've used fragments before. you got a long page and you click to go a certain, to a certain section, right? That's what a fragment tag is. In HTML, the way that you do this is you've got div ID of place. So by the ID, 
right? And if you want to code a link that goes to that place, you go a href uh, equals pound place. Link that goes to that div, right? So these two pieces together were something that you guys did in the HTML class to create fragments on a page. And of course, there's a dynamic way of doing that with this ASP fragment. So here's the static way of doing it. Um, as far as the, uh, here's the HTML that you put. I used a div, they use an H2, as long as you give it an ID. And then here's your fragment helper um, that jumps to the HTML placeholder on the same page. And the URL that it generates is just with the pound symbol in front of it. Um, again, if you've used Wikipedia, I'm sure there's many other sites that do that. So this particular link goes to muroc.com. Again, that's an absolute link. And to an ASP fragment of the idea of reviews. And this is the URL, it goes to muroc.com. Uh, the shop controller, details, route ID, fragment. So there's a lot going on here. Basically piecing them all together, piece by piece. Yeah, that's a good question. Um, I could only answer that because here's, I, I'll answer that with another question. <laughs> I don't like to do that, but I will. Here we're making our links with all of these helper attributes. You notice there's no mixing and matching here. Right, so it's not like we're, it's not like we're using some of the old attributes and the new attributes together. Like all, all we're doing here is using all of the new ones together. And well, on other tags like the input tag, we can mix and match. Um, I, and so my question to answer your question which is not a good idea uh, is can you mix and match and I know in other areas of the code we do mix and match um, so I could only assume that you couldn't mix and match here but how would you append them together maybe is the idea right because this is essentially appending all these pieces together So, so that would be that would be one thought. One thought, you know, would be well, you know, how would you take the uh, href attribute because that's that's the old way of doing it, a href, and combine it with these different pieces. And I don't know the answer to that question. So, if you're going to use the new approach with your links. You know, this is how you can concatenate them all together, essentially, um, is my first thought. Let me think on that some more, though. Okay. Yeah. Second question. Um, so it's, it seems like to me that the, uh, the controller and the shop and the details, that's all, like, internal on your, like, what you've coded on your website. But then the Muroc. Well, you would have to know that the receiving server would have these this URL, okay. right? Yeah. Clearly, you couldn't control that. Uh, 
Um, the next slide or, or, or spot in the book basically is a review of your C sharp format specifiers. And so if you recall from C sharp, you have format specifiers. And the idea behind a format specifier is that you take a string, you take a string number, and you format it in a certain way. And so generally speaking, you can format something as currency. What does it mean? Well, it means it has a dollar sign in the front. It's got commas at the thousands place, in the millions place, right? So every, basically every three spaces, there's a comma, and then there's two decimal places, right? So you could take any string number and format it as a currency. Uh, that's one kind of very common option. You can format it as a number. Well, a number is much like a currency. It's got commas. It doesn't necessarily have two decimal places. You can say N4, and now you've got four decimal places. And so you can specify the number of decimal places, and it, there's no dollar sign, right? So currency and number, pretty similar. This one has a dollar sign. This one, you specify the... Um, number of decimals um, and then percent now as a reminder right if you're formatting a percent uh, well what does the number one equate to well the number one you know is is a hundred percent right so if you have you know if you have a string if you have a string two and you format that as a percent, you know, the output of that is gonna be 200%, right? Or if you've got a, you just gotta keep in mind like 0 0.5, 0 0.5 colon is what you do, colon percent, well, of course, that's 50%, right? So, so 1.5, you know, if you take the number 100, this is where it gets a little weird, right? Take the number 100, well, if one is 100%, uh, you add two more decimals. So it's 10,000%, right? So just keep in mind how that works when you format it as percent. But yeah, those are just format specifiers. You can go to the C-sharp docs and kind of read. There are others. You can format it as decimal, kind of the same idea as a number. Fixed notation, again, others minor differences. Those are the big ones though. So we could take some values, load them up in a view bag, and then format them different ways. Percent with one decimal place, 4.5 percent. Okay, all of this up until slide 40 is using views without models, right? All this theory so far has not introduced a model, of course. The class is called data-driven web applications, right? So we are worried about bringing in some models. So as we saw, our products table and our categories table um, are pretty standard. Here's two more overloads of our method call. Right, this return from the controller to the view. Uh, you can send a model object, so a single object. Of course, it could be a list of that model objects, right? Um, you can also say, hey, return to a different view besides, um, besides kind of the default, as well as return the model data, right? So that's not necessarily new. We've coded both of those lines before. Uh, here's an example, right? 
of using this right here, returning a model item to a view. Ultimately, this line right here does just that. What is a little bit different in this chapter that we haven't done before, the syntax here on our query, if we take a look here, we're selecting a single product, calling it product. We're hitting our database where the product ID equals the ID that's passed in. We're including the category for that particular product. First, our default gets the first instance where that ID is equal. Um, essentially, else generate a new product. And so what this essentially does is if that ID is not found, if first our default returns no item found, right? If our query doesn't return an item, we generate a new product. You have any? Well, no, no, this is, see this double question mark? Mm -hmm. I don't know that we covered that operator in C Sharp. Um, um, let's see, here we go, question mark and question. Null coalescing operators. The null coalescing operator returns a value on its left hand if it isn't null. Otherwise, it evaluates uh, the right hand operation and returns the result. Right? So basically, the way that comes back is it's like, hey, if our query returns null, then don't use it and do this instead. It's almost like an if else, right? It's almost like an if else. So if this query comes back null, then don't use it and return this instead. Um, and what does that do? Well, it just returns an empty product to the view. Uh, well, that won't, what would that do? Well, if we're trying to view a single product, it's not gonna have a picture, it's not gonna have a name, it's just gonna be an empty page. But it doesn't break anything. Um, what you were talking about, let's see if I've got add edit on here. Under admin area, views, here's add update in the controller. Uh, there's list, add, update well there you go yes Vinny I answered that incorrectly this is exactly the place where they're using that I answered that incorrectly I'm sorry because here's an update and we try and query for the existing item. If not, generate a new product. So this is kind of like the add edit? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So the double question marks is basically like if... Oh, there it is. There it's the update. This was the get. This is the get. Uh, this is the post. This is where you're talking about, right, Vinny? Yeah, basically. There it is. That's still there. Yeah, but still in the get, um, if it's not, like, you're going to query all of that stuff. If it doesn't come back from anything, then it's just going to give you, like, a new product to make at that point, right? Yes. So that, that part hasn't changed. Yeah, so we go to update something. We're passing in this ID. If it doesn't find the ID, it's like updating an empty item. Um, you might be curious, right? Maybe you've noticed this or not. There's using a lowercase model in your razor uh, views versus a capital model. Um, in the views, so let's just pop open a view. Let's open up the product view. 
So up at the top, um, when you're when you're defining, when you say you're defining, they call it binding, right? You're binding your model to a view. Um, so you're basically saying, hey, this view, this view uses a list of products. And so when you're when you're doing that process, you're basically linking your view to a particular model. That's where you use the lowercase model directive here for, for razor syntax. The capital um, model is, let's see if it's down here. Um, there we go. So here's a for each loop here is to say for each product in your model. So the capital model is when you want to actually code a piece of data. Uh, but because of this is a list, we're looping through it. So in other places, we're doing model dot name, model dot product ID model dot and you're using the capital M syntax with the at symbol in front of it. Um, let's see if I just go to an individual like delete. Obviously deleting is an individual product and here's an example of using model dot name without a loop. We're just deleting one particular product. Do, 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 do. So we covered that, we covered this. Capital model versus lowercase model. Okay. Um, on this slide, I just want to point out that if you take a look, a close look at this, we know that this is going to make a text box. And we also know that a text box has the input type of text, right? But you don't see the type of text here, right? The actual type of the control, we kind of leave it up to uh, uh, .NET or whatever you want to say, right? We leave it up to the server. It's really up to the server to look at our data types, right? Name is a string, and because it's a string, it's going to be a text box. So there's kind of a default type that is assumed here, right? But earlier I kind of mentioned combining these tag helpers with all of the normal attributes. So this is an example of doing that. The point is this, again, I'm just going to say it's not what is received by the client. The client will get an input type of text. Um, when we were doing this in one of the labs, we had a date and time control, right? And did it not generate like a date time picker in the browser, right? You didn't have to say equals input type equals date time, right? You just said input ASP4 date, and it kind of took care of the control for us. You'll note that you can change that. If you don't want the server to generate the type attribute, because that's what's created here, input type of text, you can hard code that, right? And you could say, no, I want my control to be rendered like blah, and that's within your, that's within your ability. So again, there's some, some convention here because this is a string, it'll generate a text box, um, but you can overwrite that by, by putting in a type attribute. Um, these two pieces of data right here, these are hidden controls. You notice they did type, they did manually put the type of hidden, right? That hides it from the end user. However, it will be sent back to the controller so the controller can use the product ID and the name however it needs, right? So that's why you, you want to load up the data in the view so that when they post it, that this data can be sent back in a post for however that that uh, action needs to use it. Yeah. 
So do you have to <coughs> do input type of hidden for any information that you're not um, like reading on the page? If it's critical for that for that controller to use, like a lot of times you're querying by ID or maybe by the the category name, filtering by category names. Yes. Okay. Yeah. So so I would I would definitely load up if I'm not showing it. I would hide it. Do you um, think that's like an oversight on like whoever made this, like that you would need to do that, or is that something that does that just make sense? Like, uh, I just I just have never gotten that. Like, you're sending the information to the page already, or at least so I thought. Yeah, you're sending it down to the client, yeah. and then the client's going to click a button that's going to be sent back, kind of deal. Yeah, so I thought the the information just existed without it having to be like the input uh, on the page somewhere. Like, I don't know. Yeah, it does because you've queried the, this data out of the database, mm -hmm. and this kind of avoids you from maybe having to do that again. Oh, okay. You know? Okay, that makes sense. Yeah. So it's storing it on the page, basically. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, so now you don't have to do another trip to the database. Because <clears throat> right, cause at this point, we've got the data out of the database, and sure. that should help with that. All right, so there's our update. Bada bing, bada boom. This slide again just shows you that what is sent down to the client is quite different than what you coded. Like what you coded for this price looks like looks like this right here. So you actually have to code less, right? Because what this one line of code renders in the client is a type of text, an HTML ID of price, a name of price, and a value that is gotten out of the database. Very cool. Yep. <coughs> um, we learned one syntax for drop down lists already like we were looping over view bags dot categories and for each option we were generating um, you know model dot ID and then the name that for the user to see there's another method so if I kind of back up here um, on a select element there's a helper tag that we haven't learned about so here's another helper tag on a select that's called ASP items. And then in there, you pass it a value that's called a select list. Well, this is a method call, a constructor. You're going to notice there's four arguments here, right? So this is just another way of generating a drop-down list. The first thing is, what is the list that you're generating? So you're going to have a list of products or a list of categories. You pass that identifier here. The second is what is the value attribute that each option will store. The third is what is the, the text value that the user sees. And then the fourth is, uh, is there a value selected by default? So let, let's take a look at this. Um, this, is, this is on a controller. We're loading up our categories, right? So we got three categories that we're loading up in view bag dot categories. Here's our select tag. Here's our ASP helper attribute called ASP items. We're generating a new select list. We're looping through our categories. The value attribute is category ID. And then what the user sees is name. Um, this is a bootstrap class of form select. So basically gets the select tag to be formatted in a bootstrap way. Ryan. Where if you don't want that um, selected item, you just leave that blank. 
Yeah, actually, the only argument here that's required, the only argument that's required of the four is the first one. Um, many times, though, you're going to want to configure the second and the third because those are important, right? So yeah, if you don't want one to be selected by default, you can leave that blank. The only one that's required is the first one. Um, meh. This is the HTML that's generated based on that, that code that you wrote. Right, we gotta select. This is your bootstrap class. Category ID. We got three options. First one is selected by default. This is that other syntax that we learned. Well, no, this isn't a drop-down list. This is just looping through, creating some links. Let's see what what is. This is just a demonstration of the products. We, uh, we inspected this code earlier. And so we already analyzed slide 56, slide 57. Last slide. Yes. So we've got a list of products, no filtering. If there's no filtering, you put it in a table for each product in your model, spit it out, you get a bootstrap table. Okay, the next piece of theory in this chapter deals with nested layouts and I'm not sure um, that this is necessarily doing a nested layout so um, by default kind of like your first layout is what is underscore layout so just a review of this again inside of shared we got underscore layout notice there's also inside of shared now this is something that was created this is main layout so let's let's kind of start by inspecting layout layouts not a whole lot going on inside of layout there's a body tag and a footer tag with render body so kind of the parent I think of this as a hierarchy the main parent is layout main layout is a secondary layout right so this is a child if you will that uses layout and adds in a header and a main. So what it allows you to do is have different pages that use different layouts. If you just want, if you have a view that you just want to use the footer, your view can use underscore layout. And um, that would be totally fine. You could see that in view start, this application is set to use underscore main layout. So by default, all of your views are gonna have a header and a footer. Because again, um, layout just has a footer. Main layout has your header, a main, 
<laughs> and a footer. And just to kind of like go home, right? If we inspect the HTML that's here, you can see the end result. You've got a body, a header, a main, and a footer. Um, back in underscore layout, underneath the render body, you've got the footer. And so this is just this concept of having nested layouts. You could have different views that use different pieces. Yeah, Ben. No, 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 no. No? Nope. Main layout does not have a footer. But it's, it's taking from the, the other layout, which... Does have a footer, footer. yes. So, like, I guess what I'm saying is, if you're really just trying to have a footer on one and not have a footer on the other, wouldn't, you just, wouldn't it be easier to just code that in the view instead of having to make a whole new layout? I feel like you would really only need, a, like, one layout unless, you know, you're trying to do, like... One has an app I think you're on, I, I understand where you're coming from. And it's like, how complex does your site really need to be before yeah. you start having multiple layouts? Right. I would agree with that. Like the stuff we're making, you know, it's, it's not that complex. Like one page is going to have an app bar, one's not. Maybe, maybe five, ten pages, tw you know, mm -hmm. and most of them can probably, in our use cases, you know. Now, are there sites that are way more complex and you might want different? completely different templates for different sections, mm -hmm. yes, okay. right? So um, the, scope of the, website. the scope of the website, if it got bigger, I could see this being more practical, right? But um, so I, I, I do understand that point of view. Yeah. Yeah. I guess, you know, everything in main layout, everything from here, now is there two are there two main tags? Did I see that? Nope. So if I if you just kind of follow it from the top to bottom, starts with the doc type to your body tag, and then that's where main layout kicks in. Then you start with the header. Inside the header, you've got the nav, close the header, open and close the main, then you're back into footer. Okay, so that's the idea behind the Nested layouts, yep. What is that uh, render section? That is coming up. Render section, uh, you, you've seen render body before, but you have not seen render section. And so, mm -hmm. da, 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 da. Again, how you could go into any individual page and set its layout think you've done that? Maybe, maybe not. There is this property, right? So we've seen what? We've seen view bag, we've seen view data, right? We call those brothers, right? We've got a third brother called view context, right? View bag, view data, now we've got view context. And view context can be used um, to tell you a little bit about your route. So let's see how this is used here. Um, they use this view context. Ultimately what they're doing is they're setting based on your controller so you can get route data and basically view context route data get your controller to a string so get this string to say home or product or category so this variable is going to say home product or category well then based on what does c equal does c equal home if so format your anchor tag with the active class well, what does the active class do on an anchor tag? It formats your anchor tag a little bit differently. So it's like the page that you're on, right? So view context can be used to read information about your route, such as what is the controller and what is the action. 
And then with that, because, because why? Because you're setting a header inside of a layout. When you're setting a header inside of a layout, it's not like in the old days where you had five different HTML pages and then you just go into each page and set the active class, right? Now we have one file and that one file has our whole nav bar in it and we still want that nav bar to show the user what page they're on, right? And this is the solution for that. How would you have to uh, do that ternary in every single anchor tag? Yeah, that's what they do. <clears throat> yep, that's exactly what they do. And then now that they're on the about page, now we get the active bootstrap class to make it white instead of an off-white or whatever. Right. You ask about render section, Ryan. Um, so let's 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 take a look at what is inside of a layout. Notice we're linking to bootstrap inside of our layout. So we have our scripts. And for anyone who's, you know, built a few pages, you know, you, you start leaning on third party scripts and you start bringing them into the pages that you need them on. Right. But anytime you start bringing in third party scripts, it slows your page down. Right. You because what has to happen? Your HTML has to load, it goes out and it finds the script and it has to basically bring it in to, for use, right? And that just takes time, right? You have to download a resource and you have to, you know, the, uh, the JavaScript engine has to like understand all the methods that you wrote so that when you call those methods in the HTML, it knows how to work with them, okay? So you're bringing in scripts. Suffice to say, you know, here we have a template and we might not want every script on every page. Maybe, you know, maybe there's, and then this example is a really good example. There's a, a validation script, right? So jQuery validation, right? You might want to bring in jQuery validation because you've used this library before, you're familiar with it, but you, do you need to validate every page? No, you just got to validate the you know, whatever pages you got to form on, you got to do a post, right? So this render section says, hey, if my view has a, a scripts section, and you'll see how to create a script section, if my view has a script section, then go ahead and bring that in for that view. But you don't need to bring in all these scripts on all the pages, right? And so it's, it allows you to bring in different scripts onto just the pages that need them instead of bringing them into all the pages. So this is part one of using render scripts, right? Then the second part is on the view. Um, so let's see if I can go into one of my views and we could take a look what that side looks like. Uh, da, 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 da. Views, product, um, probably not there. Let's go into admin, areas, admin, and like an update. So we go to product, update, and see, okay, here's our section called scripts, right? So now, now this is actually at the top but you know because of where it was on the template the render section it's going to bring in these script tags only on that particular view wherever i just put it right to, 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 to add update there we go Does that makes sense so so um this required of false. So first off, this is the name of it, scripts. So this render section has to match. Required false means it's not required on every page. Of course, it's 
a little bit more complex if you start having nested scripts. So if I were to do this right now, our, uh, da, 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 da. our render section is being done on essentially the parent. It's not being done on the child. But if I wanted to do this render section on the child, the syntax would be a little bit different, right? Um, that's the last piece of theory on this chapter, right? So certainly some review of some old stuff, certainly a fair amount of new stuff. Um, I'm going to pause for the moment. Okay, so if you guys want to code along, I'm starting in the student download, EX Starts Chapter 7, Guitar Shop. Student download EX starts guitar shop. <coughs> yeah, it should probably tell us to do that. But we'll see because I already have the database in there because I already ran that right, so. We'll see if it tells us what to do. It says run the app. So let's run the app. See if you guys get the same results as I do. Let me close that down. This is no migrations or apply, yeah. Right. So, yeah, so go ahead and run the update database. So, like, literally, you, you can't get here? No, no, no I, I just meant, like, you don't have to update the database. It said no migrations were on there, so I don't think you need to update. Okay. Unless I'm wrong. I'm assuming if you go to products, like your 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 data is not there. So, I'm assuming if you click on products, it crashes. Uh, no, because this is the same information we used on the last. Oh, okay. So you've you've got this database already. Yeah, it's using the same one. Oh, okay. Okay. It says click the about link in the navigation bar. It should display some information about the guitar shop. Oh, you probably want So this is slash home slash about. Of course, if I go to my controllers, home controller. This says route of action. So this is our shortcut that we learned about last chapter to get this URL to work. Close, close, close. Remember that I'm in Firefox. Okay, click the products link. It should display the products list page. If you get an error that says cannot open database, create the database by running the update database command as described in chapter four. So you click on products, it should be there. If not, you go to your Package Manager Council, type in update hyphen database. The left column should display a list of product categories. Each of these categories, click on each of these categories and note both the items listed for each category and the URL for each category. So I guess I would, I would wanna start, you know, if I'm just really being thorough, I want to look at the code to generate this nav bar on the on the side. And so let's look at that. So this is on the product controller list. So we're going to go to views, product, list. And here's our first row. Now that row closes at the end. So we've got one row, call medium 10, call medium two. So this call medium two 
is here's the two, here's the 10, right? So we've got one row, two, two parts to 10 parts. Remember bootstrap grid uses a 12 as the magic number. So it adds up to 12. So if two and 10 obviously does that. Uh, so in the, in the leftmost column, we have our list group. The top link goes to, now the boss calls me. Hey there boss, let me, uh, let me go upstairs. Sure. Call you right back. You wanna, all right, sounds good. Bye. Bye. Those guys, they were just, uh, they were just coming to say congratulations, is all that was. So this top link obviously is not in a loop, right? So this is a pretty static product list all, so we know where that goes. Um, like Ryan pointed out, we're putting this little ternary on all of our links, basically checking for the active link inside of a view bag selected category name. Here's, here's the loop that I was looking for. Again, this is on that sidebar. So here we're in our loop statically configuring the controller, the list. We're pulling out the route ID, C name. Again, that's kind of our filter, right? Fil filtering by the category name. And then, show yeah, so that's a pretty simple loop. Right, so right here, C name is what the user sees. This is all part of the URL. So these three parts are part of the URL. Okay, moving down here. Okay, so that's, I just wanted to inspect that, right? I just wanted to inspect the, the code that went into making those, those links. So this top one is static. And obviously what the active does is it kind of highlights that. That's nice, right? Right, so that's pretty clear what that's doing. Okay, I was wondering how it was doing that, but it saw the raise of syntax was just inside that class. You were wondering how it was doing that as in the active class thing? Yeah, how it was like yeah, how it was so, the way to apply active and all that, but it's all within the, the class uh, the Yeah, yeah, the uh, that ternary operator there. Yeah, 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 yeah. Okay. Where'd it go? Product view list so remember selected category name is something we loaded up in our product controller and if I go to list Uh, there's selected category name. So selected category name is set right here. Ultimately that's set equal to the ID that's passed into the list. Um, if I come over here, Literally, I can delete the word active off of my class. Just backspace it, hit enter. Yeah, and you can see it takes that blue off. So is active just a bootstrap uh, class? Yeah, on, on a list group, it kind of gives it that okay. background color right here. Yeah. List group active item, background color blue. Notice I can uncheck it. So there's the CSS that's being applied right there. Okay, I left off on step five. The left column should display the categories, guitars, click the categories, six, six, open the home controller and the corresponding home about file. Make sure the controller file in the main area, not the admin area. 
Okay, so again, open the home controller in the main area, not in the admin. Here's our about. Note the about method has a route attribute right here. In the about CSHTML, so let's go home about. View the code and note that there is no model declared. So no model declared. Step nine, open the product controller. And the corresponding list file, make sure to open the files in the main area. So here's our product controller. Here's our list. I'm going to close the other files. Product controller and list. In the product controller, note that the list method has a route attribute. We've already discussed this. The changes, so we don't have to go slash product, it's slash products, slash ID. The default ID is set to all. In the list. So what we're finding out is that, you know, this exercise is inspecting the code just like we did during the lecture. So it's just a second view over it, second pass. Know that the model directive at the top specifies a list of product objects. So here's a list of products. In the product controller, note that the list method declares and populates a list of product objects. So back in the controller, here's our categories, but here's our list of products. All products. Okay, so if the ID is all, we select star, otherwise we have a where clause. In the list file, there's a for each loop. that iterates through the model property. So down here is our for each loop that loops through our model, which is a list of products prints out one product at a time into a table. Now we get to do something. Add a contact us action method and view in the home controller class. Close, close, home controller. Add an action named contact us calls the view method. Use a route attribute for contact us. Calls the action. You can add the about action as a guide. Bada bing, bada boom. Pretty straightforward there. And then under views, home, right click, add a view, razor view empty, we call it contact us. Set the title of view data to an H1 called contact us. So view data title contact us.
tag whose value is here's how you can reach us. Open the main layout. Note how it uses the view context property to get the current controller in action. So here we kind of talked about that during the lecture. Use tag helpers to add a navigation link for contact us page and use the current controller in action to mark the link active or not. All right, so somewhere, here's our nav bar. Here's home, product, home, product, about. about. Yep. So we'll just follow that guide as about is going to be very similar to contact us. So this is the home controller and contact us question mark active otherwise empty and the quote uh, I got one extra quote here also on the action they use a double equal I don't know if that's a good eye thank you Yeah, that's, that's definitely a deal breaker. ASP controller. Home, ASP action. Contact us. The end of the day, I start making more mistakes. Contact us. Well, so we have this little view context thing that's creating a string for us. It's basically reading what is our current controller and what is our current action. Mm -hmm. And so this is saying, hey, <clears throat> if your controller is home and your action is contact us, then apply the active bootstrap class <coughs> to this anchor tag. Otherwise, I don't add anything. Okay, just looking at the URL that it created, that looks good. Right now it's products, contact us, and we're looking good. All right, so we got the active class that's being applied. Here's how you can reach us. Did I skip an H1? Of course, contact us. Let's go back to the view, add the word H1. Contact us. Here's how you can reach us. Obviously, the end. We are on step 19 of 31. Add a model to the contact us action method and use it in the view. Update the contact us action method so it creates a dictionary with a string of keys and values that holds the following data. Cool. We haven't used a dictionary in a while.
Uh, so again, this is in the controller, home controller. Contact us. New dictionary of strings. Syntax right. the dictionary as the model to the view. Update the contact us view so it's bound to a dictionary with string keys and values. I'll let you guys type for a second. Okay, so let's open up the view. Let's add a model, lowercase m o d e l, dictionary string string. Add an HTML table below the paragraph that uses the for each loop to iterate through a model and displays its values like this. So here's our for each loop. For each. Now for each loops are great at looping over dictionaries. Var item in capital model, M-O-D-E-L. Well, in the text it has app model. Okay. I just, I was curious because the last, last lab did, I don't think we uh, had the at symbol there. Yeah. Let's keep it in and see how it goes through. Now, let's, let's uh, bring in our bootstrap table. So get bootstrap.com. I'm using more Firefox lately. I don't know. I kind of don't mind. Docs. <laughs> What's really the difference? Though? It's all the same stuff. You know, um, <clears throat> the one difference. Do you remember a while ago with the latest update on Chrome, they stopped support of ad blockers? Does that ring a bell? Maybe. Uh -huh. Um. Anywho, tables. Yeah, there was a thing like six months or a year ago. Um, what I am noticing is Firefox is trending in popularity. Um, Firefox, Chrome has always been known for speed. Firefox has always been known for security. And so maybe that's just, you know, ebbs and flows. People want fast, people want speed but now uh i don't know maybe maybe you get best of both worlds i don't know moving on uh table t-a-b-l-e overview of tables let's bring in a table and i don't need Kind of hold off on all our rows and columns. 
So probably the table head will be type, contact type, and contact info. We only need one table row with our loop. Um, so I'm going to plop this for each loop right here. Put in a table row. dot key td at item dot value so for each item in the model print out its key and print out its value its keys its contact type and the values the info in there run the application navigate there there she is Yeah, that's what, that was the next thing to test. Okay, so step 24. In the views shared folder, open the layout. So we've got a render body and render section methods. Open the main layout. Notice it's nested within the layout, so its parent is layout, and it has render body method. In the areas admin views shared, so let's close all this, close all. Now we're going to navigate to areas admin, areas admin views shared folder open the admin layout notice it's also nested within layout and that the framework is able to find it even though it's in a different shared folder also notice that it calls render body and it has a section name scripts that calls render section method. So render body. And then this is uh, how to call render section inside of a child layout. Touched on that. Run the app, click on admin. Notice how the nav bar changes, but the footer stays the same. So we click on admin. So admin sees products and categories, but the footer stays the same. We go back to view site, products about us, contact us, just products and categories. So, yeah. Um, so I'm kind of actually, never mind. You get it? Okay. We're on step 28. Update the category add update view to include data validation JavaScript files. In the admin area, open the product. In the admin area, product, so it's under views. Add update. Here's our section called scripts. Two JavaScript files for data validation. And it's basically adding this to the other 
So literally copy, copy these scripts into category add update paste. That'll bring in these validation scripts when we go to add or update uh, a category. So then view it. So let's go here. Let's go back to our admin. So we're in admin, there's categories. View the page source. And you should scroll to the bottom to see the script tags for JavaScript data validation files have been added. So let's see if we can't find I see jQuery. What did we add? We added jQuery validation. Oh, gosh. Try again. Yeah, we got to add a category, and there it is. Just be on the right page. Wonderful. That lecture was long. It took all day.